Good morning. It is a little past 10 o'clock, so we will go ahead and begin this morning's virtual informational meeting. My name is Brenton Brown. I am the Chief of Staff with the South Carolina Commission for Minority Affairs, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's outreach webinar that is held in conjunction with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. On today, we will have representatives from the USDA's Farm Service Agency, Natural Resources Conservation Service, and Risk Management Agency. They will speak about financial and technical assistance that is available to minority farmers here in the state of South Carolina. Is Ms. Ann English with the Natural Resources Conservation Service? Has she joined us to make some remarks? Brenton, thank you, and good yes. morning. Good morning. Good morning. On behalf of the USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service, Farm Service Agency, and Risk Management Agency, in partnership with the South Carolina uh, Commission of Minority Affairs, I'd like to welcome each and every one of you to our virtual information meeting. Uh, we're excited that you've joined us today to gather information that will help you in making decisions about programs that can assist you in protecting your natural resources and also helping you not only protect your natural resources, but help you plan for the future, for the next generation. As we go through this presentation today, if you have questions and things, I'm gonna ask you not to be shy. To, you know, we don't mind, we, we'll answer your questions. You can put them in a chat and we'll make sure that that happens, that we answer your question. Uh, because of COVID, we have now changed the way that we do business, but that's okay. You know, our motto is like we used to say, helping people help the land. And now we are meeting people where they are. And so that means that, hey, we, we used to come out to your farm, but hopefully today you're sitting in your favorite place and we're meeting you in your kitchen or off in your sitting room, being able to absorb this information that we're trying to uh, present, that we will present to you today. See, I'm not gonna belabor long, but I just wanna say thank you for joining us. Um, you know, we will give you as much information as you need. We're not, you know, do not be shy because we really need, we really want you to have this information and to be able to utilize uh, the programs and things that have been made available through USDA. So with that, Brent, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Ms. English, and thank you for your partnership and for helping uh, landowners and producers here in the state of South Carolina. Without further ado, we will begin our presentations. We will start with the Farm Service Agency, and the first presenter will be Ms. Sabrina Bryant, who is the State Outreach Coordinator. One second, let me unmute you. You're, you're muted right now. I apologize. Thank you, Mr. Brown, for that introduction. I what? am Sabrina Bryant. Um, I am a state outreach coordinator for FSA here in South Carolina. And without um, further ado, I'm gonna jump into my presentation. Uh, the Farm Service Agency is an agency of the USDA that serves farmers and ag partners through the delivery of ag programs. Um, FSA provides farmers with a strong safety net through farm commodity and disaster programs. And they also help to conserve the nation's natural resources through the Conservation Reserve Program. The agency also provides credit to producers who are unable to receive private commercial credit with a special emphasis on beginning minority and women farmers. I'm gonna uh, just quickly go over our safety net program. <clears throat> ARC PLC, known as the Agriculture Risk Coverage and Price Loss Coverage Program, is one of our main programs. It provides payments to farmers when the actual revenue for a covered commodity falls below the expected revenue. We also have WIP, known as Wildlife and Hurricane Indemnity Program. Uh, this helps producers who are affected by natural disasters, particularly in 2018 and 2019, and who suffered losses to crops, trees, bushes, and vines. 
NAP, Non-Insured Crop Disaster Assistance Program, provides financial assistance to producers of non-insurable crops when low yields, loss of inventory, or prevented planning occur due to a natural disaster. The Livestock Indemnity Program, known as LIP, uh, pays livestock producers for livestock deaths in excess of normal mortality or injury caused by an adverse weather event or attacks by animals reintroduced to the wild by the federal government. We also have ELAP, known as the Emergency Assistance for Livestock, Honeybees, and Farm-Raised Fish Program. This pays producers for losses due to disease and certain adverse weather events, including blizzards, wildfires, and this is determined by the Secretary of Agriculture. We have the TRIAS program known as TAP. This provides financial assistance to eligible orchids and nursery tree growers to replace or rehabilitate eligible trees, bushes, and vines lost to natural disasters such as hurricanes or wildfires. And we have the Margin Protection Program for dairy. This is a voluntary risk management program for dairy producers. And it offers protection when the difference between the all milk price and the average feed cost falls below a certain dollar amount that's selected by the producer. <clears throat> Emergency Forest Restore Restoration Program known as EFRP is a cost share program that provides emergency funding and technical assistance to owners of non-industrial private forest land. Program provides assistance to carry out emergency measures to restore forest health and forest resources on land damaged by natural disasters. To be eligible for EFRP, you must have existing tree cover or had it immediately before the disaster occurred and it must be owned by non-industrial private individual group, association, corporation, or another private entity. Now I am going to review our farm loan programs. Um, first, we have our direct operating loans. These are used to purchase items such as livestock and feed, seed, equipment, fuel, insurance, this loan has a $300,000 loan limit and a maximum of seven years. We have direct farm ownership loans. Uh, this can be used to purchase or expand a farm, construct or new or improve existing farms. And it has also has a $300,000 loan limit with a maximum of a 40 year term. We have micro loans. Um, these are smaller loans, similar to our operating and ownership loans. They have a $50,000 limit and a maximum of 25 years. Our guaranteed loans. Uh, commercial lenders extend credit to family farm operators and owners who do not qualify for standard commercial loans. Farmers receive credit at a reasonable term to finance their operations or expand. And the financial institutions receive an additional, and the financial institutions receive additional loan business and servicing fees as well as up to 95% of protection from loss, which is guaranteed by the federal government. We also have youth loans. Uh, these can be used by young folks between the ages of 10 and 20 who participate in 4-H clubs, the FFA, or a similar organization. Uh, these have a $5,000 loan limit and a maximum seven-year term. Uh, minority and women farmers and ranchers, so FSA supports the full participation of minority and women family farmers in loan programs by targeting a portion of its direct and guaranteed farm ownership and operating loans specifically to these groups. Lastly, we have emergency loans. Uh, these help farmers and ranchers recover from production and physical losses, uh, usually due to some type of disaster such as drought or flooding or wildfires. Next. So how do you get started with FSA? First, contact your local FSA county office. You can locate who your office is on that website right there and schedule an appointment. Uh, due to COVID at this time, we are not accepting visitors in the offices, but you can call and schedule an appointment over the phone. Have your documentation ready for your first visit. 
such as your proof of identity, driver's license, social security card, um, proof of farm or ranch ownership, such as your deed, any leases you have, and any entity identification status, such as articles of incorporation, state trust and estate documents, partnership agreements. Once you have all your documentation, FSA will review and register your farm with a farm tracking number. And this will allow you to participate in USDA programs, including NRCS and FSA. After you are registered with your farm tracking number, you can sit down with us and uh, determine your eligibility to participate in FSA or NRCS programs. And we'll help walk you through the application process. So now I wanna talk a little bit about uh, guidance for heirs property operators who would like to participate in FSA programs. <clears throat> um, for some folks who may not know, heir property is property um, that has been passed down uh, through a family for maybe two or three generations. And so there are, there's no clear title to the land and there's several family members names who um, are on the deed. If that's a situation for you, that you may find yourself in, the 2018 Farm Bill authorizes alternative documentation uh, for heirs property operators to establish a farm tracking number. And as I mentioned earlier, this number is required to be eligible for USDA programs for both FSA and NRCS. Operators on heirs property who cannot provide owner verification or lease agreement may provide alternative documents to substantiate that they are in general control of the farming operation. What's the difference between a USDA farm operator and a farm owner? So a farm operator is defined by USDA as an individual entity or joint operation who is in general control of the farming operation for the current year of making the day-to-day -day management decisions. This could be an owner, a hired manager, a cash tenant, shared tenant, or partner. A farm owner is defined as an individual entity who has legal ownership of the farmland. Accepted items to establish your farm as an operator. You could use a court order verifying the land meets the definition of heirs property as defined in the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act. A certification from the local recorder of deeds that the recorded owner of the land is deceased and at least one heir has initiated a procedure to retitle the land. A Tennessee in common agreement approved by a majority of the owners that gives the individual the right to manage and control a portion or all of the land. Tax returns from the previous five years showing the individual has an undivided farming interest. Self-certification that the individual has control of the land for purposes of operating a farm or ranch and any other documentation acceptable by the FSA County Office that establishes that the individual has general control, including but not limited to an affidavit from an owner stating that the individual has control of the land, limited power of attorney giving the individual control of the land, or cancel checks or receipts for rent payments and or operating expenses. Now I'm gonna talk a bit about um, the pandemic assistant programs the FSA is offering due to COVID-19. Uh, first, we have our Coronavirus Food Assistance Program 2, known as CFAP 2. Um, USDA is currently providing additional financial assistance to farmers, ranchers, and producers who have been impacted by COVID-19 market disruptions due to this new pandemic assistance, pro pro <laughs> assistance for producers initiative. The original application period for CFAP2 ended in December of 2020, but it was reopened on April 5th of 2021 for at least 60 days. But we now have a new deadline, which is October 12th. Eligible producers, producers of certain agricultural commodities who face continuing market disruptions or significant marketing, marketing costs due to COVID-19. You must have an average adjusted income of less than $900,000 for 2016, 17, and 18, or derive at least 75% of your adjusted in gross income from farming, ranching, or forestry-related activities. Oops. 
Persons and legal entities must also commercially produce the eligible commodities, be in the business of farming at the time of application, comply with the provisions of the highly erodible land and wetland conservation regulations, often called conservation compliance provisions. If a foreign person, they must provide land, capital, and substantial amount of active personal labor to the farm and not have a controlled substance violation. Commodities grown under a contract in which the owner has ownership and production risk are also eligible to CFAP too. The eligible commodities are one, price trigger commodities, two, flat rate crops, and three, sales commodities. If you would like to see a full list of eligible commodities, please visit farmers.gov forward slash CFAP. Um, the list of eligible commodities is pretty extensive. And if you think you may qualify, you'll certainly want to go and visit this page and take a look. How can you file your application? You can file at uh, your local service center um, with FSA. Four applications may be submitted by mail, fax, hand delivered, or an electronic means. Call your office prior to sending applications. Again, the application and the form available at farmers.gov forward slash CFAP. If you would like to speak with someone directly about CFAP and how to apply, you can call the, the, 800, the 877 number located there on the screen and speak directly with a USDA employee. And if you have questions about CFAP, we have an extensive frequently asked question uh, page uh, located there at the bottom at that link. American Rescue Plan Debt Forgiveness. The American uh, Rescue Plan Act of 2021 provides debt relief to socially disadvantaged producer by the definition included in a statute who has an outstanding direct or guaranteed loan, such as a, storage, a farm storage facility loan with the FSA. The 2501 definition of socially disadvantaged includes African-Americans, American Indians, or Alaskan Natives, Hispanic or Latino, an Asian American or Pacific Islander. Gender is not, it is not a criteria in and of itself. USDA is now working um, to review and implement the Act and more guidance will be coming soon for qualified buyers, borrowers. If you have questions about um, this debt forgiveness and if you qualify or are eligible, please go to that link right there at the bottom www.farmer forward slash American Rescue Plan forward slash ARP dash FAQ. Um, this is a seven or eight page document that pretty much lays out all the eligibility rules for this program. Okay. Next, we have our Pandemic Assistance for Timber Harvesters and Haulers Program. Uh, USDA is providing up to $200 million to provide relief to timber harvesting and timber hauling businesses that have experienced losses due to COVID-19. Uh, timber harvesting and hauling businesses must have a 10%, at least a 10% loss during the period of January 1 and December 1 of 2020, compared to the period of January 1 through December 1 of 2019. This program is open July 22nd through October 15th of 2021. To be eligible for payments, individuals must be a timber harvesting or hauling business where 50% or more of its gross revenue is derived from one or more of the following items, cutting timber, transporting timber, or processing wood on site on forest land, such as chipping, grinding, uh, converting to biochar, cutting to small limbs. If you want info more information about PATH, please visit that website there at the bottom or call our 877 number that's listed. So we'll be hosting a PATH webinar on September 15th at 2 p.m. If you do the events page on the South Carolina FSA website, you will be able to register for that event if you would like more information. Next. Frequently asked questions. So I get a lot of questions and I thought I would just review a few here 
if anyone had had these on their mind. Um, why should I register my farm with FSA? Your farm number identifies and registers your land with the FSA and makes your farm eligible to apply for USDA program. You must have a farm number in order to apply for farm loans, disaster assistance, and crop insurance, as well as NRCS programs such as EQIP. At this time, a farm number is not required to apply for the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program. The farm number is associated with the land. The history of production on the land is connected to the farm number and the land. If you decide to sell the land or not continue to farm the land, the farm number and production history still remain a part of the value of the land. I want to get a FSA loan to purchase a farm. Do I need farm experience? FSA's direct farm ownership loans are used to buy a farm or ranch. This type of loan is different from all the other FSA loan offerings because Congress wrote into the law an additional three-year farm management experience requirement. These three years of experience must be within 10 years of the date of the loan application. So if you want to, um, acquire a farm ownership loan, you would need at least three years of experience in farming. Can I get a special type of loan because I'm, I am a historically underserved farmer, beginning farmer or veteran? Loans to historically underserved and women farmers and ranchers are not a special type of loan, pro, loan program or loan type. Rather, this designation refers to a specific funding source known as socially disadvantaged SDA funding. To be considered for targeted SDA loan funding, loan applicants must voluntarily provide his or her ethnicity, race, and or gender on a loan application. Otherwise, the agency's loan process and loan requirements are identical for all loan participants. So if you want to be considered for this special funding, just make sure that you um, have this information known on your loan application. What credit score is required to be approved for FSA loan? FSA does not use credit scores. Loan applicants are expected to have acceptable repayment history with other creditors, including the federal government. However, loan applicants are not automatically disqualified if there are isolated incidents of slow payments, no credit history, or if it can be shown that any recent credit problems were temporary and beyond the loan applicant's control. No history of credit transactions by a loan applicant does not automatically indicate an unacceptable credit history. Uh, here is my contact information. If you would like to get in touch with me, that's my name, my email address there, sabrina.bryant at usda.gov. And that is my number. My extension has changed. It is now 102. So I'm um, sorry, that's not updated, but I would like to make a note of that. And if you would like more information about FSA and our program, please go to the website below and subscribe to our monthly newsletter in Gov, Gov Delivery. And you'll be able to get up to date information about programs that are coming out from FSA. If you have any questions for me, please put them in the chat. I will be here for the remainder of the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bryant for that wonderful information. Um, once again, let me make some housekeeping notes for everyone. Um, today's webinar <coughs> will be recorded and a link will be provided to you following the session for the recording. If you have any questions, please enter your questions in the chat box function at the bottom of your screen. We will address any questions at the conclusion of the individual presentations. If you need to speak, please use the raise your hand feature and I will acknowledge you by sending a request to unmute your phone. However, please note we will have a brief Q&A period immediately after all the presentations. And also, if you are joining by phone, you can unmute yourself by pressing star six. Um, once again, um, we this is going to be translated into Spanish. Um, so if you would please just bear with us, we will make sure that we get that translation to you um, into, into the Spanish language. Up next for our presentation, we are going to have Ms. Stacy Henry. She is the Area Resource Conservationist with the USDA NRCS. And without any further ado, 
Ms. Henry, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Brown, for that introduction. Good morning, my name is Stacy Henry. I am the, with uh, the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Next slide. Next. There we go. Uh, NRCS gives advice uh, to on 101 personal advice on how to treat resource concerns on your land. And resource concerns that we may address would be plant suitability, plant suitability, soil erosion, air quality, water quality, and animal concerns with livestock and wildlife. It's NRCS goal to make investments in their op in producer operations and local communities. NRCS generates, manages, and shares the data, technology, and standards to help make informed decisions on your land. We have many tools backed by technology and research that we use to make these informed decisions. Next slide. NRCS has many cost share programs that have allowed us to invest an average of $8 million every day into conservation systems that help producers stay profitable and productive. Next slide. Of those cost share programs, one of our most popular programs is the Environmental Quality Incentive Program known as EQIP. EQIP is a voluntary conservation program that helps farmers and owners of agriculture land, including forest landowners, improve natural resources. Next, oh, as you can see here, these are the different land uses that we can cover. We have forest land, we have grazing lands where you see the watering facility. We also work on confined animal operations such as poultry operations and dairy operations. We also cover crop land. We are interested in uh, wildlife habitat. And also we work with not only cattle, but we also work with other animals such as goats. Next slide. This is our seasonal high tunnel. This is also one of our popular practices. The goal of this high tunnel is to help improve your plant health and vigor and also help extend your growing season. They're easy to build, maintain, and they also provide an energy efficient way to extend your growing season. Next slide. Our seasonal high tunnel has a maximum size restriction and that has been removed. However, there is a $10,000 cost cap for this practice. To receive equip cost share assistance for irrigation, the land must be irrigated two of the past five years. This practice applies to existing cultivated cropland. So if you are already growing a garden or have or growing crops to produce for production, we can uh, cost share up to $10,000 uh, for a high tunnel system. Your crops must be grown in the natural soil as you saw in the picture previously. No containers are allowed. These systems must be built from pre-manufactured kits. The tunnel frame must be made of metal, wood, or durable plastic and must be at least six feet in height. Next slide. Here you can see the photo on the left. It shows no irrigation uh, system installed. The producer here has been using a garden hose and a sprinkler that you can see in this picture to establish their irrigation history. So you do not necessarily have to be irrigating for us to cost share for your high tunnel system. As you can see here on the right, this is a high tunnel with a curtain raised to help ventilation so that pollinators can help, can enter and help pollinate some of the crops in, inside. Next slide. Equip irrigation financial assistance. Irrigation assistance under the Environmental Quality Incentive Program is only available to producers who are converting existing systems to a more efficient irrigation method. 
as you could see in the previous picture where they were irrigating with a regular sprinkler, a normal garden sprinkler, you can see that that is not as efficient as something like the drip irrigation you see here in these pictures. This form of irrigation is much more efficient and can deliver the water directly to the plant. These, um, for us to be able to cost share for this more efficient method, we require an irrigation history of you irrigating two out of the last five years. Next slide. Livestock systems. This has to do with our grazing lands. For grazing lands, we call share for pasture planting, fencing, watering facilities, heavy use areas, pasture spraying, and livestock water wells. We also have uh, tools that we can use to help get you on a more efficient grazing system. As you can see in the picture below, we have this little goat drinking out of a watering facility. He is standing on what we call the heavy use area. This helps prevent ponding and soil erosion underneath the animals. Next slide. Longleaf pine. NRCS in South Carolina has a longleaf pine initiative. This is special funding for specific areas. Next slide. As you can see in this photo, this is our longleaf initiative priority area. Um, you can see it in the cream color that is in the lower part of the state. In the 17, 1800s, there was about 90 million acres of longleaf. Today we have anywhere between four to five percent of that area in longleaf. So this is a big priority area where we are trying to reestablish the longleaf ecosystem. Next slide. In this program, we can do things such as conservation cover, which provides cover for wildlife and other endangered species that are um, indicative of the uh, longleaf habitat. It's a food source and a habitat source. We can also provide prescribed burning cost share assistance and tree shrub establishment where we plant your longleaf pines. Next slide. Our next popular program is Conservation Stewardship Program. The Conservation Stewardship Pro Program encourages ag and forest producers to maintain existing conservation activities and adopt new ones on their operations. So as you can see below, we can still do some burning, but we would enhance that. So if you are already burning your pines, we would go in and say, let's do a patch of burning. Let's start making patch blocks of burning. This is very good to do for wildlife habitat. Next slide. The eligibility criteria for CSP is you must be able to meet two priority resource concerns at the time of application, water quality and soil quality, plus one additional resource concern by the end of the contract. You must include the eligible land in your entire agriculture or forestry operation. And you would um, get your eligibility or farm and track number from the FSA office. Next slide. CSP pays participants for conservation performance. The higher the performance, the higher the payment. These contracts are five years long and have the option to renew at the end of the fifth year. The minimum payment per year is $1,500. So if your incentives that you are trying to obtain through um, your enhancements and uh, your acreage do not add up to $1,500 a year, we run a script, there's a script and it brings you up to the $1,500 minimum. So everyone gets at least $1,500 per year. There's a payment limitation on $40,000 for individuals per year. Next slide. What is this, this conservation stewardship program? This program is used to enhance. So here you can see that 
the animals are in the uh, water body here and they're grazing and they can freely enter and exit the water body. So an enhancement here would be to put up a fence and keep those animals out. And so we would be addressing um, pathogens in surface water. We would also be addressing animal health. Uh, it's not very good for your animals to be in and out of the water like that. And, um, and so we would enhance your property by fencing the animals out of um, the water body. And here in the photo on the right, you can establish native grasses in your pasture, or you can intercede legumes into your forage base. Next slide. Cover crop and no-till systems help to reduce erosion and increase soil health and soil organic matter. So this, under the CSP program, we would encourage no-till and possibly cover crops to help increase your soil health and organic matter. Here on the right, you can see that this field has been enhanced with a field border. So the distance between the trees and the actual cropland, that is your field border. This helps to provide wildlife food and cover, and it's also good for pollinator habitat that could possibly be assisting in pollination of your crop. Next slide. CSP will help establish uh, pollinator habitat borders for food or habitat. It is also a source of shelter. We can also establish monarch butterfly habitat that includes milkweed as shown above. Next slide. Here we would like to, here you can see where we have, in, we have created patch openings. Patch openings in a, hard, in a pine forest will help to enhance wildlife cover, food, shelter, and provide a space in between all the trees for animals to, um, to seek the food cover and shelter. And here on the right, we have reduced the forest stand density to help improve a degraded plant community. When your trees are overstocked, that becomes a degraded plant community. So we would go in and thin your trees and cut some of those out to help improve wildlife food sources. So as you cut your trees, that allows the sunlight to hit the ground so that other plants and other desirable plants can start to grow for those wildlife animals. Next slide. There are several eligibility requirements for NRCS programs. Here are some of those eligi eligibility requirements. You must be an individual or legal entity. You must have signature authority for your legal entity. You must be the owner or actively engaged in the management of the agriculture or forestry operation being enrolled. This is documented by the following. It's documented with records from FSA that Ms. Sabrina talked about earlier. This identifies the owner and operator of that track and farm number. You must also have production of $1,000 in ag products produced sold or both. Woodland owners are exempt from this requirement. Next slide. You must have control of the land. So in the CSP program, um, you can enroll land that you don't own as long as you have control of that land. And that would also be documented in Farm Service Agency records. You must be in compliance with the provisions for protecting the interest of tenants and sharecroppers that are involved. You must be in compliance with highly erodible land and wetland provisions, and you must be within farm bill appropriation payment limitation of 450,000 from the period of fiscal year 2019 through fiscal year 2023. Next slide. You must meet the average adjusted gross income of $900,000, and you must meet the special emphasis applicant criteria that is self-certifying to receive 90% cost share rate. And we have special programs uh, embedded into EQIP and CSP for new and beginning farmers, limited resource producers, socially disadvantaged farmers, or veteran farmers. And if you are, or trying to acquire organic payment, you must meet the requirements for the organic initiative. 
Next slide. Not only do you have to become eligible, your land must become eligible. It must be agriculture land. So you are more than likely gonna already be producing something on your land, whether it's hay, crops, or trees. It must be privately owned land documented by a deed or lease, and you must have permission of the landowner to install any structural practices if your land is leased. You must have an identified resource concern and you must have an irrigation history two out of the last five years if you're applying for irrigation. Next slide. Participants meeting one of the four categories of special emphasis applicants are eligible through the, with the 90% payment rate. And those are new and beginning farmer where you must meet both of these criteria. You must not op have operated your land for more than 10 consecutive years and you must provide the day-to-day -day operation labor. Next slide. Socially disadvantaged includes all minority participants. Limited resource farmer must meet both a gross farm sales of not more than the current index value for each of the two previous years and the total household income at or below the national poverty level for a family of four. For more information on limited resource farmer, we have a tool where you can input your data and it will tell you whether or not you qualify for a limited resource farmer. Next slide. Veteran farmer is a farmer who has served in the armed forces and has operated a farm no more than 10 years or who first obtained veteran status during the most recent 10 year period. Veteran farmers must meet the new and beginning farmer criteria. Next slide. So what are the steps that you take to get this financial assistance through NRCS? We have local offices in every county in the state and you would want to visit those offices and meet with your DC. Now, right now, because of COVID, we do have some restrictions. I am gonna put our state link in the chat box where you can go to that link and see our state website. And there you can find which office will help serve you. The numbers will be provided in that link. So the first step you would do is you would visit your local NRCS office to discuss your goals and work with staff to create what we call a conservation plan. This plan will include a plan of operation which will give you dates and practices and help you schedule those practices through time. We will also be giving you job sheets that help describe the practices and what's expected to meet our standards and specifications. You will work with that local NRCS field office to create your conservation plan. You can also fill out an application in these offices. The NRCS employee will help you complete an application for financial assistance. The next thing you would want to do is you would want to get eligible. Ms. Sabrina talked about eligibility earlier. These are some of the eligibility requirements that NRCS requires for you to get cost share assistance. NRCS will also help you fill out some of these documents to obtain financial assistance and to become eligible. Ranking. Once a, the district conservationist out of your local office visits your farm, he will or she will go back and rank your application according to the resource concerns that you have on your property. And then it would be time to implement your conservation plan as the money is given out and you become obligated. This is the fun part. This is where you get to put the conservation on the land yourself and you are work by signing the contract at obligation to implement these practices. Next slide. For more information on our programs, please visit www.sc.nrcs at usda.gov or call your local NRCS Conservation District. As I said before, I'll be putting information in the chat box to help you get to the right place. Next slide.
So how to locate your USDA service center. We're gonna take you to the website and you can click on contact us and then you will be, the website has changed and we need to update the slide, but you will be able to click on contact us. And then the next link that pops up will say, locate your nearest service center. And that will take you to the most appropriate um, county. Next slide. Please go into your local office. You know, don't ever think that you're not eligible. Go in, talk with your local district conservationist, see what programs can offer for you. You can always sign an application. Signing an application does not obligate you to do anything, but it does help us address any resource concerns that we, you may have on your property. Signing the application will allow us to put you in for the appropriate fiscal year so that if funding is available and you decide that you do want to do funding, we can have that application on file and just continue to work with you to get you that funding. You do not have to have funding for NRCS to assist you with a conservation plan, but there is money out there. So please, please contact your local service center and sign up. We are willing to help you do anything you need to do on your land. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you again, Ms. Henry, for all the information you just provided. Um, once again, her contact information was given. And also at the same time, she will be around to answer any questions uh, that you may have during our question and answer period. I see that there are um, some links that are in the chat box. So once again, uh, if you will please uh, click on those links to receive the information uh, that you need. Uh, once again, um, we will make sure that this information is translated for those who need it translated into a language other than English. And I also see in the chat box that there are some fact sheets that have been made available um, in Spanish for those who need those translated into Spanish. Um, next, we will have a presentation from Ms. Davina Lee. Um, she is the director of the Valdosta Regional Office for the USDA's Risk Management Agency. Without any further ado, Ms. Lee, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Brown, and good morning, everyone. As he mentioned, my name is Davina Lee. I'm in the Vadosta Regional Office um, and work with the USDA Risk Management Agency. RMA is a federal crop insurance. We administer the federal crop insurance program. My office is in Georgia, and because we are a regional office, we are responsible for several states um, in the southeast which includes South Carolina, Alabama, Florida, um, Georgia, and then the island of Puerto Rico. Um, next slide. So the purpose of crop insurance, as I mentioned, we're a regulatory agency. Um, so we are responsible for developing the program. The purpose of having crop insurance is to help farmers and producers to mitigate production and revenue risk. We've also found out that several lending institutions will not allow farmers to borrow money if they don't have crop insurance. So this is another good purpose and another good reason to be able to show your lenders that you have collateral in the crop that you're producing and by showing them, providing them a copy of your crop insurance policy. The third purpose um, is to help maintain a durable rural economy, which during disaster years, whether it be drought, freeze, or hurricanes, some of the catastrophic disasters, um, having crop insurance will allow producers to receive an income for crops they may have lost production on to help them to recover, recover from the crop year or to prepare for the next crop year. Next slide. The Risk Management Agency develops and approves policies and provides program oversight. We have a public-private partnership with what we call the approved insurance providers. They are the ones who actually sell and service the products for us. Next slide. We are responsible, RMA is responsible for um, developing the policy terms, procedures, rates, and prices for our programs. We validate, we validate premium and loss information that we receive from our insurance providers 
And we're also actively reviewing um, ways to offer new products and program expansion to help producers manage the business risk. We know agriculture is constantly changing. There are new um, varieties being developed. There are new ways to produce crops. And we're always looking for ways to make sure our policies are up to date and that we can develop new policies to help um, provide coverage and a safety net for our farmers. Next slide. So um, not only do we have things that we're obligated to do as um, the risk management agency, as well as our insurance providers, um, producers must report their acreage and any required information accurately and timely to your crop insurance agent or insurance company. You must meet policy deadlines, pay premiums when they're due, and report any losses that you um, even think you might have in a timely manner. Next slide. In turn, producers will receive accurate answers to any questions about their coverage, the prompt processing of your policy, and timely payment of your um, losses if you have if you have any. Next slide. So the federal crop insurance provides protection from production loss, price decline, or a combination of both for individual commodities. There are production and revenue plans of insurance, which are based on a farmer's actual production history. Our area plans of insurance are based on averages in an area, like for a county. We also um, know that SSA has an insurance program in the areas where crop insurance is not offered. So please be mindful of that as well. And Sabrina has already covered their NAP program. Next slide. RMA has several policies out um, for, uh, have developed several policies. We have everything from your traditional row crops, such as peanuts, cotton, corn, soybeans. Um, we also have specialty crops for our fruit, our fruits and vegetables. Um, but there are other commodities that we also insure, such as livestock, um, dairy, dairy revenue protection, insure milk. We insure um, pasture, rangeland, and forage. We do have policies and programs that are in a, what we consider a pilot status or a 508H, which means they're only um, available in certain parts of the country. Um, in our area, in my region, there are two right now, um, hemp and then strawberries. Those are only available in the states I have identified and then only in select counties. However, if we do have programs or policies out nationwide, as long as they're not a pilot or 508H, if a particular program, crop insurance program is not offered in your county, there still is a way for you to possibly get insurance. See the um, next slide, please. We call that process requesting a written agreement. We advise you producers to get with your crop insurance agent so that it can help you fill this request out. It will come to our office. It allows um, us to individually insure you for any crop that has an existing insurance program in another county. The requirements are you must have produced a crop or a similar crop in the county or area for at least three years. You will work with your insurance agent, as I mentioned, to request to, to complete the request that would be sent to our office. We'll evaluate and make a decision as to whether or not it's feasible to offer the written agreement. To be considered, the request must be signed by the grower no later than the sales closing date. And again, your crop insurance agent will be able to help you determine when that is. Next slide. Most of our crop insurance policies cover the listed um, losses, causes of loss. Adverse weather, including freeze, frost, heat, drought, and hail. We also ensure catastrophic weather events, such as hurricanes, tornadoes, um, failure of irrigation water supply, fire, insects, and disease, as long as proper control measures 
are being used and you're following acceptable good farming practices. Next slide. <clears throat> this is just for informational purposes, um, looking in South Carolina for crop year 2020. These are our top 10 commodities that were insured based on the liability. Corn, of course, was the highest at $149.4 million um, in value. Next slide. Also wanted to share over the last three years, the number of acres that we have insured in South Carolina alone, as well as the indemnities that we paid out due to losses incurred. Um, so on average, we've insured at least 1.1 million acres over the last three years. And as of Monday, or as of September 3rd, the total number of losses that we paid out for crop year 2020 has been over $100 million. And most of that was due to excess moisture or hurricanes. Next slide. So RMA offers um, different levels of coverage for you to purchase. CAT or catastrophic insurance is the minimum level of coverage. It covers 50% of your yield at 50% and up to 55% of your price election. There is no premium that is required on our CAT policies. They are 100% subsidized, um, but there is an administrative fee of $655 for each crop and county. Our catastrophic program is very similar to FSA's NAP program. Our next level is our BIOP coverage, and it, we offer um, insurance from anywhere from 50% up to 75%. However, we do have some crops where we go up to 85% coverage level and we insure up to 100% of the price election. There is a premium that is due, but again, it is subsidized. Um, the program is subsidized so that you pay a portion and the government pays a portion. There is an administrative fee of $30 for each, count, each crop in the county. Um, you can purchase options and benefits along as well when you have the buy coverage policy. Next slide. So I mentioned about subsidy and that the government subsidized the premium for those who purchase a buy policy. This table just provides an example or shows um, what the what the portion the government would pay and then the portion you would pay. So if your premium, the total premium came out to be $100 and you purchased a policy at the 65% coverage level, the government will pay $59 of that premium and the producer would pay the remaining $41. Next slide. Here's an example of someone who may have purchased a cotton policy in Lee County. They insured their cotton at 60% coverage level their APH was 1,100 pounds per acre. It was uh, projected price for crop year 2020 was 80 cents and the harvest price was 86 cents. So with the yield protection, um, your projected price, um, you would use that. Um, so just starting from the top, if you have a 1,100 pounds per acre APH yield, you will multiply your level of coverage for this example, which is 60, 60 percent. So your pounds per acre insured is 660 pounds per acre or your guarantee is 660. Using the projected price, which is 80 cents, your amount of insurance or your liability would be $528. At, at harvest, you determine that you only actually produce 350 pounds instead of the 660 that you insured at. So again, because this is a yield-based policy, um, and I'm using the first column, the yield protection plan, um, you're using the projected price. If you had a revenue protection policy, you would use the harvest price, which is more. In this example, the, you would multiply the 350 times the projected price at 80 cents, and you'll come up with a value of that production of $280. To come up with the amount of indemnity that you would receive, 
you take the guarantee or your um, your liability or your guarantee is five hundred twenty eight dollars and you subtract that from two hundred and eighty. And then you would receive an indemnity of two hundred and forty eight dollars. Next slide. So just going to talk a little bit about our whole farm revenue crop insurance um, program. It is a, as a result of the 2014 Farm Bill. Next slide. It provides a guarantee based on your historical revenue. It is ideal for diversified, and uh, especially in organic commodities. So if you're a producer and you have um, different commodities that you're growing on your farm and you want to insure all of them under one policy, this would be an ideal policy for you, the whole farm revenue. Um, we offer protection for many commodities not currently covered by RMA or not available in your state or county, such as sweet potatoes, um, strawberry, livestock, um, broccoli, and carrots, some of your specialty crops that we may not necessarily have a policy for. You can insure it under this whole farm revenue policy. Next slide. The coverage levels range from 50 to 85 percent. The more commodities you have, the more discounts that you are eligible to receive, and it reduces your cost. Um, you can purchase an NPCI policy, which is our um, individual policy, as well as a whole farm policy, and it also plays or reduces your premium cost for your whole farm. The caveat is you cannot have cat coverage from that NPCI policy, um, as well as whole farm. You can only have a bio policy and a whole farm policy. You can also have NAP and whole farm at the same time. Next, next um, slide, please. This is just an example of what you would see if you're interested in trying to find out um, what commodities we cover under whole farm in your county. Again, this example is for Lee County. Um, I'll show you how to get to or give you, a, let you know where to go to find this, um, this use, how to use this tool. This is what we call our actual information browser. Um, you would select the, for the commodity whole farm, the crop year, your state and your county. Then you would go to the commodity tab as I have circled here. And then once you go to the commodity tab, you'll see all of the commodities that we insure in Lee County under our whole farm. Next slide. Oh, if there is anything, once you go to your county, if there is anything that is not listed, especially crop that you think we should have, you would just contact our office at rsoga at usda.gov and let us know. Next slide. So what do I need to qualify for whole farm? You have to complete an application by the sales closing date, which is February 28th, if you are a calendar year filer. You need at least five years of tax records from your farming entity, or if you qualify as a beginning farmer or rancher, you'll only need three years. You need your five most recent Schedule Fs or substitute Schedule Fs when you're completing your application. You also need to, a list of commodities you plan to produce as well as what you expect the yield and the revenue to be for each one. Again, I would encourage you to contact, contact the crop insurance agent and they'll help you, you know, with this process. Next slide. What causes a lost payment for, under whole farm? When revenue from your crop is less than your insured value, due to natural causes of loss or decline in market price during the insurance period. To file a loss or to file a claim, you must, you must file your, your taxes for the insurance year before a claim can be, can be made. So for example, for your 2021 farm taxes must be filed for crop year 2021 um, claim to be processed. Okay, next slide. This table just shows you, um, again, with Whole Farm, what the subsidy assistance would be. The more commodities you have, um, the more the discount, premium subsidy discount you will be able to receive. If you take a notice at the, um, the MPCI policy, which I've already kind of showed you a little bit what the subsidies are there, 
um, you notice the difference between at the 65% coverage level, how much subsidy discount you receive versus if you had at least three commodities. So 59 versus 80%. So um, again, the more commodities, the more diverse you are, the more discount and assistance, the more discounts you will receive. Next slide. And the last thing I'll mention before I go into how to find some of our tools is um, our beginning farmer and veteran farmer um, rancher benefits. Um, if applied for and granted, it lasts, your status will last up to five years. You will be exempt from any administrative fee for catastrophic coverage and additional coverage policies. You'll receive, if you purchase a buyout policy, you'll receive an additional 10 percentage points of premium subsidy. You are allowed to be able to use production history or farming operations that you were previously involved in in making the decisions or physical activities. So there are some benefits if you are applied as a beginning farmer and rancher or a veteran farmer and rancher. So again, get with your crop insurance agent to find out more and how to complete this application. Next slide. On our website, which you can find at rma.usda, Gov. There are several tools that you can use to um, help you. Um, the first one I mentioned about the actual information browser. If you hit the, um, if you hit the key a couple of times, uh, um, okay, yeah. All right. So the first, if you go to our, once you get to our website, if you could click on um, tools across the top, there are several to bring up the tools that you can use. I've, I've highlighted the actual information browser. That tool allows you to um, enter your commodity that you're interested in finding information about, say it in the county, and then it'll bring up the prices, the rates, the yields, and any special provision statements that we have that are pertaining to um, that crop in your county. Um, there's also the cost estimator, which is over to your right. Using that tool will help you to, it will allow you to input your individual farming information, your acres, again, your crop, and um, help you come up with what it would potentially cost you to purchase a policy, as well as what you might would receive if you had a loss. And then the last thing I wanna highlight, the agent locator. Um, this is where you would go to find a crop insurance agent in your county. Um, if you are new to insurance and you don't know um, what agents are selling crop insurance in your area, you can put in, when you click on this link, you can put in your state and your county and it'll list, give you a list of all of the agents that are selling in your county or near you. Next slide. Um, that's all that I have. And um, Britton, I'll turn it back over to you uh, for questions. Thank you once again, Ms. Lee, for all the wonderful information that you provided to our attendees on today. Um, now we will jump into the question and answer portion. Um, once again, um, to reiterate, today's webinar is recorded and all those who have registered will receive a link to the recording once that recording um, has been finalized. If you have any questions, please enter them in the chat box function at the bottom of your screen. However, if you would like to speak, you can do so by using the raise hand feature and I will acknowledge you um, by send, sending you a request to unmute your computer or your phone. If you are joining us by phone on today, you can unmute yourself to speak by pressing star six. See no hands raised from our attendees as of right now. Um, but what I would like to do is to point out that in the chat box, uh, there has been some wonderful information that has been placed there um, by our presenters on today. Uh, some of this information is in English and some of it is in Spanish. So if you need to avail yourself of that information, please feel free to do so. Also, if there's some follow-up that you need, please do not hesitate to follow up with our presenters on today. All of their contact information will be made available once you receive the recording on today. Um, but once again, I'm still looking in the chat box 
and I see no questions that are raised, uh, I'd like to know from our USDA partners um, if there's any concluding information that you would like to share, um, uh, something that you may not have gone over or um, some more information that you think would be important for our attendees on today. Okay, seeing none and still seeing no questions coming from any of our attendees in the chat box. Um, let me go ahead and conclude. Um, this is the second um, USDA informational session that we have had. Uh, we had one at the end of July, and of course, um, we have one here. There's another one that is scheduled for October 7th. Once again, we would like to thank all of our presenters for the wonderful information that they have presented uh, to help our minority landowners and producers. If you have any questions of any of the presentations that were given on today, please do not hesitate to reach out to those presenters or to re reach out to your local USDA office so that they can be able to assist you with any of your needs. Once again, my name is Brenton Brown. I am the uh, Chief of Staff with the South Carolina Commission for Minority Affairs. And I would like to thank all of our USDA partners. Uh, this would not be able to be possible without the wonderful work of the USDA and what they are doing not only in our state, but also across our nation. So once again, thank you all for the work that you do in our communities. Uh, I hope that everyone has a great day. Please stay safe. And if you have any questions and need to follow up, please do not hesitate to do so. So once again, on behalf of the Commission for Minority Affairs, and also on behalf of our USDA partners, we would like to thank you for joining us. Have a great day and please stay safe.